Got so much news to talk about. Threads, the state of investing with someone who actually spends the money, and chaos in the ad tech ecosystem. My conversation with one of the best investors in the world coming up right after this. Welcome to Big Technology Podcast, a show for cool-headed, nuanced conversation of the tech world and beyond. Zach Coleus is our guest today. He's the managing partner at Coleus Capital. He is the friend of the podcast. We've had him on in the past. Last time he told us he'd lost money on just one investment that he had made. Well, we're going to get an update on that and plenty more today. But first, we're going to talk about thread, about threads. Zach, welcome to the show. Yeah, great to be back. Great to see you again. Always great to see you too. Always a pleasure. Likewise. So are you on thread? You are on threads. I found your account. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's Z Coleus or Zach Coleus. I'm, you know, this, uh, I'm not used to promoting myself on, uh, uh <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg property, on a Zuckerberg property. So, um, what do we, what do we got here? Let's look it up. Cause you know, got to get that out there. Cause as you look it up, I want to yeah. definitely start with something that you said on threads, which I thought was pretty, uh, insightful and actually kind of picks oh. up on what we were talking about last week with Alex Heath on, on the show, you wrote, uh, I wonder how much this app cannibalizes Facebook blue versus Twitter. It seems like it will be a material amount. So basically your thought is that, look, this is going to take energy away from flagship Facebook. I think it will take energy away from Instagram almost or as much or as much as it will take energy away from Twitter. Now mm-hmm. I'm actually even more convinced that it's going to take energy away from Twitter. The mm-hmm. thing is booming. I mean, a hundred million users as of Monday, we're recording this Monday. Who knows it'll be what it'll be on Wednesday morning when we publish. Zach, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think there's a couple parts there. Um, one, the hundred million thing, I, you know, everyone is is excited about it and they're talking about it. But I think we have to be careful because, like, Facebook could create a hundred million users on you know a poop app, like if they wanted to. If they were like okay. they were like, let's we want to make this big. They could they could basically because of their control of, of such a gigantic user base they could move those people onto anything so the question is is how much of this is is viral organic natural people are excited they're telling other people it's the movement of people to value in the product and how much of this is just distribution um and we don't know right i have no idea um but i i I take the hundred million with a grain of salt when it comes to it being a Facebook property. Now, so, okay, I'll um, take it a grain of salt also, what Zuckerberg said, which is that they've done very little outside promotion. It's been mostly <laughs> organic. So, okay, we're taking We also know he has personal animus with Elon Musk, so that's an important factor to consider. But that's yeah. it. here's the yeah. counterpoint, right? Which is yeah. that Facebook has tried to create lots of standalone apps in the past. Yeah. Many of them have failed. It tried basically yeah. a, a direct Snapchat competitor, mm-hmm. and that didn't go anywhere. It had an app called Threads in the past, which was a direct message app, and that yeah. didn't work. Yeah. So like this, something is obviously working when you're yes, in yes. the app, you yeah, feel yeah, 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 there yeah. is an energy there. Yeah. No, 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 no question. I just, I always like to like, to, it's easy to basically look at a headline number and then just assume, assume things. And I mm-hmm. think, you know, as we've learned in the past, um, those assumptions are not always correct. I think the other thing that I'm, I'm particularly interested in is like, you know, remember the early days of Clubhouse? And how unbelievably yes. amazing it was, and how the community was just like, just astonishingly good. And then, very, very quickly, basically, the grifters, the information entrepreneurs, the people who are hacking human biases, the angry political voices came in and they destroyed that community. And so, I think what's, what's interesting is how long will the magic that is threads right now like I, when i open threads i don't see a lot of that garbage like i'm seeing mm-hmm. my friends and i'm seeing interesting things and like it's valuable there's not a lot of garbage in it um what happens when um those those folks show up on mass and start start polluting the waters um i don't know i'm 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 very i'll be very interested to see how it all plays out so thinking it through, like the argument with Threads would be that Threads was, I'm sorry, the argument with space, uh, Clubhouse was that it was really a feature, right? This wasn't a standalone app, right? This was something that might exist within a Twitter. But now you have Threads, that's a proven format, right? It's a text-based app like Twitter. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, though. I mean, I'm not a consumer yeah. pro. Like, I don't mm-hmm. invest in consumer, really. So, like. You know, take this with a fistful of salt. Like, I'm not claiming to be an expert here. But, like, 
I, I think if Clubhouse could have maintained the magic that was the early days, that's not a feature. That's magic. That's mm-hmm. that's that's a special thing. That, that like at the end of the day, I think what I think the thing that the mistake that a lot of people made, including all the investors who dumped a shitload of money into it, was that they thought the magic that was Clubhouse was a function of the product that had been built, and what. Instead, that magic was the very careful audience curation that happened in the beginning, and that's what made it magical. And um, Threads is magical, right? Well, I don't know if it's magical. It's not Clubhouse magical, but it was like it's it's be- it's not it polluted energy. yet. So, like the question is: is is that lack of pollution is that sustainable, uh, or is it going to go away? And I, I don't know. And there's I think there's interesting questions around if if there's algorithmic sort of tools that Facebook has developed to help keep it from becoming polluted. That, which makes sense. Like with AI now, you can do some really interesting stuff that you didn't used to be able to do before. It would make sense to me that Threads is basically largely build a next generation AI for filtering the feed that works. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, I would assume the same thing as well. And one of the things that we saw in the early days of Clubhouse was that in any new social app, now people understand that there's kind of a land, land grab for audience at the beginning which yeah. is why you would end up getting, you know, so many interesting people showing up at Clubhouse because, you know, they wanted to see what the experience was and they liked the experience, but also they were like, wait, I go on one of these, you know, conversations or one of these live Clubhouses uh, and next thing I know, I have 10,000 followers on this and mm-hmm. what's that worth? Mm-hmm. And it seems like the same thing is happening on Threads where it's like, oh, yeah. there are large audiences up for grabs. So people are investing more than they necessarily should just to see if they can build that audience in the land grab and i think you're totally right zach the real question is what happens once you know that land grab starts to peter out and people say is the audience that i have here worth the energy that i'm putting into versus the audience that i have on twitter and linkedin or wherever it is yeah like i mean so like for instance on linkedin i have 140,000 followers on linkedin like you know theoretically that makes me a big shot in reality yeah it's not really all that impactful and my twitter following is you know a fifth of that and it's substantially more impactful in terms of like the value that i get out of it um and so we'll see what happens with threads i i assume what will happen is it's just it just it just further dilutes the audiences across all the different platforms and further segments them and so the value of threads will not be anywhere near as valuable as twitter because cause that's my my guess. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, I didn't want to end this conversation or this side of the conversation without talking about that original thread that you posted, which is that you said basically that there's going to be cannibalization that will happen to Facebook properties. And yeah, you look definitely. at it, and by the way, I don't know if you've had this experience, but every time I open threads, it's an image or video. Mm-hmm. And every time I open Instagram, it's the same thing. So, I mean, I what are we trying now? They're, they're compelling. I mean, yeah. obviously with Instagram, it's just images. Let's Let's see what the... I mean, look, I moved it from the back of my apps to the the front of my apps. Um, um, oh, actually, I have a, a text post at the top and then a link. So maybe this is not completely holding up. Yeah, I've got I one from three hours ago that's, oh, it's, it's a long text thing with an image. And then the next one is an image uh, that looks very Instagrammy. Right. Um, That's the theory here is that it's just going to look more and more like Instagram. And then does it sort of dilute the growth of Instagram? I mean, we spoke about yeah, it on Friday, but I'm curious what you think about it. Because you, I mean, you pointed that out right away as soon as you got on the app. Uh, well, yeah, I think there's, there's the, 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 the question I have, and I'm not an expert at this. And the, my friends who work at these big companies are a thousand times smarter than I am, is does, does when you have sort of like large scale, like when you're you're really big, does the incremental cannibalization have larger than incremental consequences to the network effects of the mm-hmm. the property? So like, does losing ten percent of Facebook equal just ten percent? Facebook's ten percent smaller, and Threads is ten percent bigger, and it's just like it's just moving the the sort of chairs around, or is ten percent actually have a fifteen, twenty, thirty percent impact because of the lowered subsequent engagement for everybody and the lower value of the property because you've got, you know, 10% of 10% is gone. So now it's, it just starts to shrink as a result. The product becomes less useful. Um, I mean, I think I, we all noticed that with Facebook blue 
when they made the algorithm changes to allow politics and news, and then it became this crazy fucking <laughs> fucking Republican uncle thing. And then everyone like was like, fuck this, and everyone left. And now my feed is a fraction of as interesting on Facebook Blue as it used to be, you know, before they started to do that. Um, you know, everyone moved to Twitter and Instagram. So I don't know, maybe I don't, it's an interesting question. They have the data, I don't. Right, and it does seem, you know, it's like that te- if you lose 10% and you lose greater uh, than that 10% on your network, it seems like Twitter is probably the most risk of, of that happening. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think this is this is a direct blow to Twitter, and it will be. I mean, the thing is, is that even if it only carves off a portion of the Twitter audience and Twitter keeps a bunch of these other, like I'm assuming they're going to keep the sort of right-wing folks will stay on Twitter. Um, I'm assuming the... You know, there'll be like certain groups that will stay on Twitter. But if they carve off a portion of that, then, you know, then it's the same. The same question is like, does 10 percent equal a more than 10 percent decline in the value? And for Twitter, I think, yes. Like if 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 the interesting tech people gravitate over to threads and that's where they all go, I think Twitter's going to see a pretty significant hit from that. Monetization. So Facebook can make forty dollars per person on its platform. Snapchat makes $13 in a year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, Twitter's always struggled. I mean, mm-hmm. we both come from the ad world, so we know yeah, what, yeah. what the yeah. story is. You need to have performance advertising, basically ads that compute to sales. And Twitter has always struggled to do that because its ad system has just been inferior, while Facebook's ad system has been much better in terms of optimization. Now, Mark Zuckerberg has said, okay, we're not going to turn on monetization until... We're on the path to a billion users. Yeah, I, I've heard from folks um, that, and this isn't, I, I don't really want to get too deep into the sourcing, but take this for what it's worth, that we could potentially see something like in Q4. That's when people are expecting it because that's when, you know, it's holiday season, advertisers are expecting, you know, or need places to put their money. And, you know, Facebook can now say we're 100 million users in, there'll probably be 200 million users in at that point. It's time to turn this on. Mm-hmm. I mean, they could make a serious amount. They, they, so Twitter in its best year in 2021 made $5 billion. With Facebook's ad tooling and a similar user number, I mean, could you see four times that much? I mean, let's see why not. Um, at the end of the day, this is exactly what Facebook is very, very good at monetizing, which is you know, feed-based attention modality. And they've got the advertisers. They've got the ad formats. They, I mean, it's, it's 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 a one for one replacement for, you know, advertising on blue for sure, like identical effectively, and um, you know, very similar to a lot of Instagram elements. So I don't think they would have any problem making comparable revenues. I mean, then the you have to remember these businesses. They 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 are very strategic about when they want to utilize revenue opportunities like this to fill holes in other parts of the business. So Mm -hmm. if, uh, you know, if they were still, if they're strong right now, which I don't know if they are, obviously they've gone through some really struggles since um, uh, ATT. Um, uh, But if they're, if they're feeling strong, they want to hold this back to have it as, you know, um, uh, a lever they can turn when they need it. Um, when something else comes short and they can turn this lever to, to fill a hole. Uh, if they're not feeling as strong, they'll monetize sooner. I don't know. I'm not, I, don't, I, don't have, I have no inside information on this. Yeah, it's very interesting. And of course, Twitter just hires Linda Yaccarino, who comes from NBC and is trying her whole thing is, I'm going to convince advertisers that this is a place where they can feel comfortable spending their money. Yeah. And meanwhile, Elon is challenging Mark Zuckerberg to a, quote, literal dick measuring contest. And someone goes, at Linda Yaccarino, can you please help? And I'm like looking at that. I'm like, no, she can't. Like, she's not going to be able to. It's almost like, you know, so I think Aaron Levy, who's going to come on the show in a couple of weeks, he put up the list of all the mistakes that Elon's made. And it's like, this does seem to be the exact list of things that you'd want to do if you were like literally trying to destroy the platform you just bought. Uh, but push back on me. Yeah, I'm curious what you think. I mean, look, I... I generally have felt like there's like that the social media by definition creates this weird echo chamber feedback loop that causes humans to lose their goddamn minds. So like right. with Trump, we saw that 
Like we see that over and over again. And I think with Elon, that's happening, right? Like mm -hmm. I think in most circumstances, if we knew all the details of what was happening inside these companies and we paid as close of attention as we do as we do to Elon and Trump, we would think the same things we think about Elon, regardless of if the companies are succeeding or failing. I just think that like the incentives are for the individuals as an axe to grind to push information out. And the individuals who have good information, you know, they don't really have the same incentive to like go out there and try to mm. spread the word that things are actually good. And so you end up with a whole bunch of fucking losers spreading a whole bunch of crap to make the world seem horrible. And so, mm. and then the feedback loop is depressed. Just they eat that shit up. They love it. They're just suckers for it. And so like, Oh, any individual with an axe to grind, they, they like they they spread that shit, and I, I think it just leads to this really nasty feedback loop, and then the audience becomes very, very sort of convinced that that's the reality. Like, right. like for instance, like you you and I know, like when we think about ad tech, right? Like when we read what the press writes about ad tech, it's just like it's hot garbage. It's total garbage. They yeah. have no idea what they're talking about. They don't understand it technically. They don't understand it. They don't even understand the most basic concepts. Like they're just fucking it is morons. It's really embarrassing. It, it's That's embarrassing. True. And yeah. and so then you're like you're like okay, this it's like these people are fucking stupid. And then you're like you have to remember, okay, we know this is true for this. What level of relative insight do we think they have for everything else they write about and the reality is probably not very much because they have to cover everything right their job mm -hmm. is to literally write about everything and to become experts in everything which nobody is and so then mm -hmm. then you have to just assume that they're effectively playing to the their incentives and their incentives are to get clicks and the things that are, that get clicks are outrage and, and 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 playing into the human psyche and biases and so 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 therefore to bring this all back, I think Elon has got a lot of bad press because mm -hmm. everyone loves to hate on the guy. I think he also enjoys playing into that. I don't know why, but he does, it seems. And I don't know the fuck. But I, I, if, I had to, if I had to underwrite the whole thing, put money on it, I think the, the, the perception of Elon versus the reality is very far apart, almost by definition, I'm sure. And I bet you the perception is skewed dramatically worse than the reality is. And I think that then I think we'll be surprised. I think, no I think look there. Okay, go ahead. All right. I, I, think, I think people are going to be, I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I don't have enough information to know if what's going to happen, but like, I think on average people are usually per, are surprised in these instances when things work out better than they thought they, thought they would. Yeah. Okay. Well now I'm going to say my thing because you know, I, I think that first of all, with, I don't want to spend the whole podcast talking about this. We have so much good stuff to get to, but Whatever I feel like we should, we should at least like take a moment to talk about it. So first of all, I think that, that yes, like when you work in an industry and you read press reports about it almost all the time, you're rolling your eyes. And yeah. I think that's, that's bad. certainly bad and true. I think that there are some reporters that are good and they, and we know them from in the ad tech world. And I think when people yeah. specialize, then they can actually get stuff right as opposed to, but what we're talking, what we were talking about in this past bit of conversation, which is like, you have like, and I'm not going to, well, I'm going to pick on the Guardian. Like you'll have like a, a journalist from the Guardian who tries to explain like real time bidding and yeah. like talks about how it's evil. And you like read that and you know anything about real time bidding and you're like, just yeah. burn it, just burn, you know, print this out on a paper and burn it. You, you should yeah. not be writing about this stuff. So yeah. yeah, those journalists, they definitely bring the whole profession down. Now in terms of like the way that the press is, um, handling Elon like yeah definitely I think the press is telling a story of Elon that's worse than what it is but this is the thing that gets lost in it often is like as a user you can tell like you can tell sometimes that the product is when but you're the using product the product was a hot mess for, for a it decade was, no doubt it was a hot mess but it's it's almost unusable now and I'm, I'll just put oh really it's decisions. dramatically worse what is it what's worse yes. in your opinion I think that all right. I'll just go back to the um, the coup with uh, in Russia with Prigozhin or the insurrection mutiny, whatever you okay. want to call it. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to know who the reporters were on the ground in there Russia. There's no reporters on the ground there. There are no reporters on the ground in Russia. There, I mean, they're, they're, they're the only Ukraine. good reporter in Russia yeah. they put in jail. Yeah, yeah. No, I know we spoke about him on uh, last last Wednesday's show. Yeah. Um, okay, but let let me say like the people who are like. You know, the reporters on the ground in Ukraine or the people who are actually reporting on this on the living. I'd, I wanted to see that. Those but we exist. Next to them. 
Yeah, but it was much harder to figure out who they were. It took longer. But why, why do you it think that's Twitter's useful. fault? Because they removed the blue check mark from the all. Oh, all, got report. it. Did you and used to be like, blue check? Sorry. Did you used to be blue check? Yeah, I don't. It doesn't matter okay. about me. Oh, no, 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 no. I, like, I don't care. I think. I do. I think. I think. Yeah. I think what's interesting is, mm -hmm. um, I think it's. I think it's always interesting to call out to try to identify our own biases, even if we don't think that they impact us. Right. Because right. the thing that's that's um. Uh. They're they're real. I think they're very real. So our biases. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You you okay. have a bias. So all right, let's all right. Let's say even if that's the case, even if that's playing in here, like yeah, you do. Twitter is a news and information source. Yeah. Okay. So yes. I, I understand the argument. Who's reporting? And I'm not going to say I, if I see a blue check mark next to them, I'm not saying I trust them. I, look, I agree I'm with you. The, the argument is yeah. a good argument. I don't disagree mm -hmm. with the argument. The but the counter argument, right? Which is Twitter needs to figure out how to separate who is a real person from a bot. Mm -hmm. They have to do that. That's the only way to basically take Twitter to the next level. Otherwise, the fucking Anons and the, the and doing it with the legacy blue check system was not working. It was not working. And so the idea, the big idea was, great, let's get the users to pay a little bit of money and then use that money to fund uh, making more money from the platform. And if we get all the users to do that, it will work. And that's an idea. That mm. idea didn't work. Um, mm. I assume, and, and, and by the way, in the process, we can kill all these fucking blue checks that, that Elon thinks is a bunch of stuck up little bitches, which, you know, whatever. Uh, so like, I, mean, I assume yeah. that they're going, they tried it, they failed, they're gonna go try it again. I mean, if Elon is good at anything, it's trying it, failing, and doing it again. He's done that over and over and over and over again. He's, got, he's good at that. Like he's he's learned how to do that better than almost anyone in the world. So like I assume that's what's happening now. We'll see. I mean maybe not, but he's also got a you know a workforce that massively destabilized, and I don't know how well they can execute relative to his needs. And now he has Zuck with his you know fucking beating him about the face. So he's got he's got a real hard road. Yes, he does. Yeah. But I think the blue check thing was a risk potentially. You know they, that they they they. They they took unclear if how it will work out. There's so much better ways to have done it though. If they were trying to get to what your aim is, just connect a credit card, pay a cent. That's it. Sure. Look, I, the eight dollars. Like, so, but the same like the thing is, like this and the execution this, of it. This is the thing. Mm -hmm. The 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 reality that we're discussing right now, right, versus the reality of actually building the product. So if we were at the company. And mm -hmm. we had access to all the data, and we had access to all the things that's ever been tried, and we had the team, and we made the decisions that we made. I guarantee you the difference between what we're talking about right now and what they have is the same difference between the Guardian writing about RTB and what we actually know the difference is. So we are morons relative to the person in the seat making the decision. And so when we have the conversation about, well, they could have just done it this way. Generally, I have to take that with a huge fistful of salt. Yes. We are well, the Guardian. No, I disagree with that. I really No, do. I know you do, I but do. you're wrong. We are I, the Guardian. I've been inside a tech company also, so I understand the constraints no, no, that no. exist. Okay. But you can also see, like, at the end of the day, like, you you are what you do, right? Like, yes. you're, you are, and, and that's the product that they produce. Like, it's too early to judge yes. anyone mm. based on the consequences, the outcomes that they have. Like Twitter, Elon I mean, blew up four rockets, three or four rockets on the pad yeah. before he built like the most valuable company in the fucking world. Like, like the, the failures in the process are just part of the process. And so like mm -hmm. the, for the fucking people in the stands to sit up there being like, me, look at him fail. Like, fuck that. That's bullshit. Like, like in, and in like a few years we can look back and we can say, oh, he's a failure. Great. In a few years, I'm happy to do that. But until then, I, I my belief is like it, it, it's just a bunch of fucking people in the stands yelling about shit they don't actually know about. Okay, I think that like <laughs> saying. Sorry, you know, I didn't mean to attack your whole no, profession no. in this. No, podcast. it's okay. By the way, like Zach, like this is why we're here. Like you're on the show because I know we're gonna have a good conversation. And on this show, I don't want any 
like we shouldn't hold back. Like we should have a real discussion about don't it worry, when it I, comes to this. I don't know how to hold back. I'm, I'm no, it's good. It. It's good. As much as I probably should learn how to do it. No, no. I mean, well, I'll do it in places other than this forum because <laughs> this is good. No, I'm enjoying this. Right. It's fun it shouldn't be a conversation that's held behind closed door or being polite. Like, let's actually get to the heart of the matter. There's no other way to address it. Okay. So, so that's the fun part. I'm with on you. the other, I'm just going to say one last thing about this. Then we go to the next. Go thing. Then I give the last, last word. word. Then we go to the next thing, no, which go is that word. like. If you're a user of a product and the product yeah. gets worse, you're yeah. totally within your rights to say, I wish the product was not bad. Absolutely. Cool. I'm pointing for If you're on that first SpaceX rocket <laughs> or you're I'm the, the that. company that put the yeah. satellite on, I think there's a company that put the satellite in the third one, yeah. the third or fourth, I don't remember which one it was, that, that blew up. They were very unhappy. Oh, you know who it was? It was Meta. <laughs> it was Meta. <laughs> You're right, it was going. meta. Oh, it's, <laughs> this is so meta. This is beautiful. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was. And maybe this all comes back to like Zuck was mad and Elon was like, suck it, bitch. That's how rockets work. And Zuck's <laughs> held that grudge ever since. Maybe I mean, that's it. I don't know. Sometimes be, it's the simplest explanation that makes that, the, Occam's the razor. Sense. Exactly. That's, that's fair. Yes, you're right. It was meta. Beautiful. Zach Colius is with us. He's the managing partner at Colius Capital. First half, all about threads and Twitter. Second half, promise you'll be equally as good. We're going to talk a little bit about investing, a bit about what's real and what's not in AI, and then um, craziness in the ad tech world, which we know and love and we'll talk about. Back right after this. And we're back here on Big Technology Podcast with Zach Colius. He's the managing partner at Colius Capital. And in 2020, mid-2020, he tweeted this. The traditional J curve in early stage venture is currently non-existent. Usually companies without traction die early and winners take time. Over the last five years, I have invested in 63 companies. So far, only one has been a loss. One, even the lowest performers get funded. There is so much money chasing companies right now. Literally everything is getting funding. Any idiot with a checkbook, myself included, in our sector looks like a genius right now. We can argue about the cause and the potential outcome, but we can't argue that the beta only has one direction up. So here we are in 2023. The world has changed a little bit. So give yeah, us an yeah. update. Yeah, it's, uh, we were, we were, oh man, it was so good. It was so easy. <laughs> I, I raised my last fund in 2021. And mm -hmm. um, like literally it had been like, it had been six years of 50% compounding RR every year. I mean, and I mean, I looked like a genius. We all looked so smart. I, mm -hmm. My fund, it took three weeks to raise in Zoom, only in, never in, only in Zoom, no mm -hmm. in-person meetings, three weeks. People were committing on the first call. Uh, it was like, I was, it was beautiful. Ah, so good. Um, and uh, yeah, we all looked so smart. Uh, it was great. Uh, yeah, it's like Wiley Coyote, you know, it's like, you know, it's running, 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 and then just ran off the cliff. And now mm -hmm. Wiley Coyote is like hanging in midair and oh we're all God. like, oh, how far <laughs> do we have to fall? Um, yeah, so uh, we had one other company go out of business since then. So now I've got two, two dead, two dead bodies to my record. Mm -hmm. um, but we, I mean, God, we're dodging bullets left and right. Uh I had a company that I was convinced was going to fail last fall that somehow managed to scrape together around and now they're, they're doing okay, but it was like, it was a slog. Um, I have another company right now that is fighting tooth and nail to stay alive. Um, and it's, it's challenging. Um, and yeah, I mean the, the funny, I mean, literally before, before the bear market began, you know, a year and a half ago, uh, I mean, I would I would have multiple exits a year, and every company would effectively mark up every year. And you know, now it's I haven't I haven't seen a carry check, a new carry check uh, in a year and a half. Um, okay. And yeah, being a, being a VC right now in a bear market is a much harder job. It's still a fraction as hard as being an entrepreneur, like being an entrepreneur is 10 times harder or more. It's so much harder. Your job's harder than being a VC. Like this job is not that hard. You can make it as hard as you want to. Like you can, like if you want to work 80 hours a week, you can, but it's, you don't have to. Um, 
uh, and there's diminishing returns, which a lot of people don't talk about in VC, but like it's still an easy job relative, but it's much harder than it was. Yeah. Back when everything went up. I mean, literally everything, every, uh, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. What do you mean there's diminishing returns? Oh, so what happens in VC is that um, about 80% of that value in the job comes from about 20% of the work. And then anything you do beyond that, it's kind of like you're pushing a rope. And it's why you see so many VCs on Twitter and so many VCs writing Mm -hmm. thought pieces which are actually garbage and doing stuff that like, they're kind of trying to get out in the, the ecosystem to like raise their name recognition, but it's the value of it is de minimis because the real value comes from people who you've built relationships with over a long period of time that they trust you and they come to you first before they come to anyone else. And they're like, Hey, I got this thing. And you're like, mm-hmm. great. Um, uh, like, so for, I'll give you an example. Uh, it'll play into our next segment. Um, so there's an entrepreneur, uh, I had funded, uh, 2017, 2016, 2017, probably. Uh, and he built, um, uh, a, uh, 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 AI for drive through restaurants. So, you know, you go to McDonald's and you're like, Hey, I want a hamburger and fries. Mm-hmm. And uh, McDonald's bought the company and it was a great outcome for everyone. We're all super happy. And then, so in 2021, he's like, he gets free and he calls me up. He's like, I'm free. And I'm like, I'm in, <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, I'll, I, my check is here. You just tell me what the price is going to work out to be. And then in November of 21, he comes back to me. He's like, well, I got good news and bad news. The good news is we raise a shit ton of money. The bad news is the price is crazy high. And I'm like, you're, you're a pro. I'm in. I said it was in. I'm in. Um, and so then during 2022, I was like, God, I'm an idiot. Like, I top ticked the market. Like, my this is the first check from my new fund. My LPs are like, God, he's an idiot. Um, and then then the product came out in um, 20. Uh, this this lot 2020 the end of 2022 so like you know six months ago and um <laughs> it's, it's so good it's it's literally mm-hmm. lm's generative ai for call centers so you know you call oh. the airline you call a hotel and it's better than a human demonstrably better than a human it literally like it speaks whatever language you speak it speaks at whatever speed you speak at it speaks at whatever accent you need to speak in and it answers on the first ring, so it can go from one to a million agents concurrently. So literally, you call an airline, you're never going to wait on hold ever again. Waiting on hold will be like dialing a phone. Like, we talk about dialing a phone. Like, most kids don't even understand what that dialing a phone means. But like, <laughs> yeah. but literally, like, waiting on hold will be, in the English language, will be just as antiquated as dialing a phone in within a few years. Um, you'll never wait on hold again. And yeah, so it's like, it's like and, and then the great part is, is like, like that entrepreneur is so good. That company is going to be such a big outcome that like, you know, I, I didn't have to do a lot of work to get that. Just have this relationship that I've had with that guy for over a decade and do the work in that process um, to be in that position. Um, so, so it's like one of the great things about VC is that you just, you're, you're effectively harvesting the 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 labor that's been put in in the previous years. Mm-hmm. So one of the um, so in the good times, right? You mm-hmm. invested in these companies and they kind of um, you know they kept going. Yeah. And now it seems like what, 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 tell us a little bit about like what's going on now. Like the companies that you funded during the good times, like are they like you know kind of at the end of their runway and trying to raise again and struggling, or are they like they they battened down the hatches and laid off a bunch of people to get profitable and survive what, what's the sort of state of startups right now i mean all of the above the good news is is that like the majority of my portfolio generates a lot of cash we do i think we do north of i think it's 800 million in revenue across all the companies in the portfolio now wow. like it's just like it's a lot of money coming through mm-hmm. those companies so like the the vast majority of them, at least from a revenue perspective, are, are doing fine. They've just had to batten down the hashes and they've, they've found that the growth has slowed. And, and as, they, as their growth has slowed, they've had to cut back and stop spending as much. So then their growth has slowed more. So that feedback loop and then all the other companies in the ecosystem are doing the same thing. And a lot of, I, sell, I invest in B2B software companies. And so they largely will often sell to other startups. And, and so you've seen this sort of like, sort of like 
feedback loops on feedback loops, which is that like companies stop spending on growth, so they stop growing, and then they stop spending on software from other people, so then they stop buying, and then vice versa. And so the whole ecosystem has basically deflated as a result of no more free money in the ecosystem. Growth has slowed down. That's you know that's normal. That's part of what a bear market is. It it it, and it weeds out a lot of the companies that were playing company and pretending to be real things, and then it weeds out a lot of these companies, a shit ton of these companies that the VCs were funding with a bunch of dumb money, and that were that were all just fueled by dumb money, and those companies are going out of business. Thankfully, mm-hmm. I don't invest in that shit, so like I'm yeah. not getting hit yet with that. But the whole ecosystem is getting hit, and so everything is going down. And so, you know, the companies of mine that are um, that have not yet found revenue at scale, they're they're in a tough spot. Like and they they happens? have to find product market fit, mm-hmm. or they they die. Um, and what about the markdowns? Like, is that also becoming a thing that oh yeah a lot of the yeah. companies that yeah. you're working on are doing? Yeah. We have a company that that did a markdown recently. Um, you know, that's at the end of the day, there's a couple different ways it can work out. One way is that you can have what's called a pay to play situation. The way a pay to play works is they go to all the investors and they're like, hey, guess what? You need to invest at this price. Usually it's a reasonable price. Uh, you need to invest X amount of money or your holdings will be diluted by 90%. So mm. before you own 1% of the business, if you don't invest now in this round, pay to play, you're going to lose 90% of your, your, your investment. So now you're going to own one tenth of 1% of the business, uh, massive dilution unless you invest. So there's pay to play. I haven't had a pay to play happen yet in my portfolio. Um, thankfully, thankfully they're in good shape, but like I, it could happen. It's possible. Um, and then, then you just have to re underwrite the company. You have to go in, you look at how they're doing. You talk to the, you talk to the customers, you talk to the team, you're like, okay, do I want to re-underwrite this company at this price? Yes or no? It, it's just a decision that gets made on the spot. Um, and then you have down rounds, which are company goes out and they try to raise money and the money that they're trying to raise is um, uh, at a lower price than they would have raised before. And the problem with down rounds is that you end up with this situation where the existing investors have an incentive to play chicken with the new investors. Mm-hmm. So, I, a weird, I'll give you an example. We had a down round um, uh, right at the beginning, actually, of 20, uh, 2022. So right at the beginning of the bear market. And uh, the, the founder had gone out and tried to raise money and tried to raise money and failed, 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 failed. And it, he was on bad terms with his existing investors. It was a kind of a weird, weird, weird dynamic. And the new investor comes in. And it's like, I want to invest in the company. But as soon as you have bad terms with your existing investors, fuck them. I want them to take a 90% write down. Um, oh. So a total cram down of existing investors. And the existing investors were like, mm, fuck it, shut it down. Just shut down the whole business. They're playing chicken because they knew that they could get a better deal than that. that, that and, but, but their leverage was to just shut down the whole business. And mm-hmm. so the entrepreneur calls me up and it's like literally crying like, ah, this is bad. What the fuck? Like, I'm, tr- I'm trying to save the company here. And I'm like, dude, this is a negotiating posture. This is how it's going to work. And then the new investor is like, why am I even bothering with this? Like, what are you doing? And I'm, I'm a reasonably big size shareholder in this company. I, I mean, I have maybe like 500 invested in this company. And so like, it's enough that I care. So, and I call the existing investor. Wait, I'm like, how much hey, invested? what's that? How much did you have invested in it? 500K. Okay. Yeah. Um, so like, it's enough that mm-hmm. like, I you don't care. want to lose that, yeah. Well, I mean, it's my job, right? Like, right. So, you know, the current the current portfolio is about a hundred million of deployed capital. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, I have to spend my time accordingly, and you you want to spend it on the winners, not the losers. And so you, you know, when there's a write off occurring, you just that is what it is. So, I, so in this instance, I go to the existing investor. I'm like, hey, there's got to be a way we can work this out, and. So this ends up being six weeks of phone calls between these three parties with me being the mediator trying to get this thing sorted out. And of course, it sorted out exactly where you thought it would, like at a, 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 a middle ground that's fair that everyone was happy with. And we all took some dilution and the new investor got to dilute us and uh, everything got sorted out. And now the company mm-hmm. is, seems to be doing okay. But like these, these down rounds are like just incredibly time consuming. Like it's just yeah. a real because because this 
chicken that gets played between the existing investor and the new investor, the, the leverage that they both have is simply to be a stick in the mud. To, and so then you end up with this very complicated dynamic that's very time consuming. And, and, and so when that happens, it's, yeah, it's painful, very painful. Now, I wonder a little bit about AI because like there's been this moment and we spoke about this with Elliot Brown last week, but there's been this moment where like people say AI and all of a sudden it seems like it's brought back like the roaring, you know, 2020, right? And now it's like, well, how much of this is actually investable? There's been reports that like actually interest in chat GPT is going down. I had it on Google Trends. Some people had it on like the actual web traffic to this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious, like, are, are you seeing, so you mentioned the call center, yeah. Uh, application that's very interesting yeah, yeah are you seeing like real and practical uses of this latest wave of generative ai and can you share a few examples yeah yeah no i mean i'm i'm i've seen quite a few i, I i'm i'm a real believer in um what i'm seeing um it's not perfect it's not magic it doesn't it doesn't solve all the world's problems and it won't invent you know an endless tub of ice cream that we can always have just sitting in front of us that just automatically replenishes not yet anyway um but it doesn't it is powerful so for instance i have another company in the uh, business process outsourcing space so they basically they take things that were done by humans in the philippines and in india before and they automate them and it's like it's better it's demonstrably better than what they were getting before it's cheaper like what type it's of faster. processes do they automate um they're not very public so i'm not gonna okay i'm not gonna talk like about i what, used to report on this company um Oh, what's it called? Uh, name's escaping me right now. Okay. But it's, uh, they, they, yeah, they did robotic process automation. Mm-hmm. Is it mm-hmm. similar to that type of stuff? Mm-hmm. Similar in a way. It's different. This is, this is different in its own way, but they're, but yeah, there's, there's some similarities, but, but the end, the end result is, is that AI makes that better, you know, for the call center thing, AI makes that better. Mm-hmm. Um, for, uh, I have another company called Fireflies, you might know. They do, mm-hmm. um, uh, they do, your zoom calls, they basically transcribe your zoom calls and they turn them into action items. And, and I mean, fireflies is, I mean, AI has made, they got early access to GPT four and Mm -hmm. I mean, God, that product got, it was already good and it got really good. Like people, if you're not using fireflies right now for your zoom calls, you're making a mistake. So Um, what does it do? It just transcribes and then gives you like some notes and action items. Yeah. So it it transcribes Mm -hmm. the entire call, figures out what, you discussed and then creates all of your follow-ups and action items and it can push information into your CRM. Like it does, Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, if you're, if you're a professional and you're doing calls that have anything that you need to keep track of and you're not using fireflies, you are literally Mm -hmm. making a mistake. Like, yeah, the company, the company that I was thinking of again is UiPath. Yeah. Uh, UiPath, of course. Yeah. Romanian company. Amazing company. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, no. UiPath is great. Um, but AI has taken that whole market and like that and and really dramatically increase the performance of the products Mm -hmm. and so if you think about that at the end of the day like all software products are is they're like tools to help people do their jobs better and when you Mm -hmm. make those tools better then people can basically get better outcomes and they become more efficient and the world becomes a better place and so broadly i think ai is um it's a big, big monster, awesome trend, and we're seeing we're seeing a lot of consequences. Um, when it comes to like the consumer use case, like ChatGPT as a consumer use case, I, I personally have found it to be. I still prefer to search and read the source materials versus like go just ask the question of ChatGPT. I find the answers are kind of like they're they're kind of like. They're weak. They're just they're just sort of soft, and they're not. They don't have an edge to them that I find interesting, and I don't understand the conflicts between the various different positions on a subject. It's just mm-hmm. like, oh, here's the answer, and then you go read the source material, and you're like, well, eh, that might be the answer, but it's it just seems like it's sort of the mismatch center. Like it's just like take all this, mash it together, and come up with the most probabilistically sort of vanilla answer we can get. So I I have not found ChatGPT has not become like one of my main go to sources, but that's just me personally. Um, and I'm not a consumer investor, so I don't have a good sense of like where consumers are thinking about it from a personal use case. Yeah. And it's just one of those stories where the data is also just like very instructive, I think, in terms of like, all right, well, less people visiting. I mean, I know they did release an app, but I don't see it very high in the app store. So yeah, 
Yeah. Um, where are you on product? I mean, you're doing AI business software. Where are you in terms of like productivity and jobs? Do you think that this is going to be something that helps create jobs? Or? Well, I mean, take the call center one. It's a good right. example. Um, when that happens, the pace that it will happen at will be so fast. I, I, I think it will be massively destabilizing. Like, mm-hmm. so think about if you're an airline and when, when, you know, when United rolls out, you know, this company's solution, um, any other airline that doesn't have it within 12 months is going to be like, they're screwed. I mean, I, are you, I'm not going to do business with an airline that doesn't answer on the first ring. Mm-hmm. Like, and like, I get that now because of status. And like, when I have to deal with an airline that doesn't have that, I'm like, ah, I can't handle this. Um, yeah. And so now every airline will be able to provide first ring better than a human AI call center. So they're all going to change very rapidly, right? They're all going to switch. And all those jobs are going to disappear overnight. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, you're 90% of those jobs, give or take, will, will, will be eliminated. And when you do that across all the call centers in the world, it's very destabilizing. Jobs. Very destabilizing. So what happens to society in that case? I, I mean, look, long term, I think the, oh, these tools make us more productive and it increases economic benefit mm-hmm. and everyone's going to be happy. Short term, that's the problem, is that like technology now is speeding up the rate of, of disruption and destabilization. And I don't think people handle that. Humans don't handle these things well. They no. go fucking crazy. And so like when you take all the call centers in the Philippines and you've lay them all off all at once that's going to be a big problem yeah so when you read mark Andreessen's will ai save the world essay well he he's got a at the end of the day do i want a world where we create things like ai to make us more productive and smarter yes is it do i do i think most of the doomers are idiots yes Mm -hmm. Um, so I largely align with Mark Andreessen, but at the end of the day, like there's nuance in the middle. Am I afraid of the consequences of AI in terms of destabilizing human systems? Absolutely. Am I afraid of AGI in the long term? Yeah. It's not a zero. Like there's Mm -hmm. real risk of like long term, long term AI cataclysm. That's, that's, that's not zero. And like two or three years ago, before you know, we came out with LLMs and generative AI, the number was a fraction of what it is now in terms of like that risk number. And you know, on the other hand, humans are just so stupid that like if you leave <laughs> us to our own devices, like we, mm-hmm. I'm more scared of humans and nuclear war and global catastrophe as a result of the way that we treat this planet than I am that much more scared of that than I am of 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 AGI destroying all the humans so therefore we either we have to we have to become smarter or we're going to destroy ourselves because we're so stupid yeah i'm in the same camp um okay so let's talk about media math media math is one of the most important ad tech companies i think of the last 10 years um and they just completely went bankrupt and they're shutting down and it's just an interesting story to me because like the way i think about it if Media math can't make it, then nobody can make it. So, well, that's not true. I'm, Trade Desk is a, a large, Trade viable public well. company that yeah. they're, but they are the only survivor really from that. Well, there's, oh, yeah. there's, there's, there's Trade Desk. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, like the, 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 like what happened to my company, Trigit, was mm-hmm. the very beginning of the emergence of the sort of like duopoly or triopoly, which is Facebook, Google, and, um, and I guess Amazon. They, they just they just crushed the the open ecosystem and they they be they you if you're an advertiser you have to work with them and if you were a you know supplier of tools for advertising on the open ecosystem um you got you got your ass handed to you now trade desk has done very well to, mm-hmm. to navigate that and they built a big business but otherwise everyone else is dead so what unless do you, you do is- unless you do you play in the sort of gray areas. There's lots of money to be made in the gray areas. Like mm-hmm. if you're if you're comfortable with ethically and morally unclear things, then there's plenty of money to be made in those areas. Yeah. So, oh, what are the um, un- morally unclear things? Oh well, I mean, if you want to advertise products that Google won't let you advertise, mm-hmm. Google won't take your money. There's people who will take your money. Like, mm-hmm. and so there's if you're if you're willing to use 
tactics and strategies that Google or Facebook is uncomfortable with to, 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 to get users to engage with ads. And there's lots of ways to do that. In the old days, it was pop-ups and pop owners and, and, and it was uh, spam. And there's lots of ways to advertise in ways that are ethically and morally dubious, but that make a lot of money. Um, there's advertisers who will be more than happy to fund uh, those ads. There's lots of ways to make money in the ad ecosystem. Um, just, you know, are you building equity value in those businesses? No, but you can put mm -hmm. a lot of cash in your pockets. Yeah. I have friends who have big yachts from that shit. Right. What do you think happened with MediaMath in particular? Was it just that there was only room for one or were there strategic mistakes there? I don't know. I, I you know, I, 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 I so I think that at pen, the end of the day, that the, pen clicking is going to come up. Sorry. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. Um, uh, I, I think the um, it's it was a challenging. It, look, if the ecosystem had stayed open, I think a lot of us would have succeeded and done well and had great outcomes. Mm -hmm. When the ecosystem became closed, the number of chairs in the game of musical chairs evaporated, and it was it became very challenging. Like remember in the beginning, the beginning days of those of us who were the sort of original DSPs. So there was Media Math, there was Turn, there was Data Zoo, um, mm. there was Trade Desk. And for those uh, and who are was, listening, that's the systems that you would buy ads with. Yeah, they, so these, so Media Math is what's known as a demand side platform. It's a tool for advertisers to buy ads out across the ecosystem. Um, and when it first came out, Back when, so we all kind of built on this concept of real-time bidding being sort of a, a way to buy and sell advertising. And we, we all, some, of, some came before that, some, and pivoted into it. Some of, some of us kind of pivoted into that once we saw that. But like, it, that was sort of the, sort of the, the gun, the starting gun going off to become sort of the, the future of the open advertising ecosystem. And we all kind of bet on that. And so in the beginning, there was um, this group of us who were, who were there invite they were they were smart mm -hmm. super smart they got bought right away for a nice outcome and then they went to go build a multi-billion dollar business so like those guys are great awesome um um and then of the bunch of us media math was really the only one left uh besides trade desk um mm -hmm. Now, now a bunch of new entrants have come in subsequently and that market has remained uh a very hot mess in a lot of different ways but um yeah so it's largely the when you say open and close. So it's largely just the big tech companies that came in and closed the the ecosystem. Effectively, we went apps, and they figured out how to do the monetization there, and that's what happened. Well, so with, like, for instance, with Facebook, um, before Facebook went public, they missed their Q four because their ad platform was complete garbage. Like they mm -hmm. had they had designed it wrong, and the they. At that point in time, um, and there's a great book by this, Antonio Garcia Martinez wrote this Chaos book, Chaos Monkeys, Monkeys about this yeah. whole journey. And we, and he wrote about, we were in that, about part of this whole process. He, he wrote mm. the book. It's a good book. And, but what happened was is they missed their Q4 because they had built their ad platform wrong. They just didn't, just didn't understand how to, how to build it the way it should have been. And then they, um, Zuck goes to the ads team and he's like, guys, what are we going to do? And he's like, give me your 10 best ideas. And one of the ideas... Uh, was to open up the Facebook ecosystem to allow independent companies to manage the advertising and target the advertising on Facebook for mm -hmm. advertisers. And so um, Zuck said to the ads team, great, do all your ideas. And that was one of them. And so then the, the ads team came to companies like us and were like, hey, do you guys want to buy ads on Facebook? So it's an open ecosystem. And like we were allowed to participate in that, in that ecosystem. And we were like, Absolutely. <laughs> We're there with bells on. And, you know, my business went, we, we made it work. Like literally the, the click through rates when we were first advertising, uh, on Facebook. So before we got in there, they were lucky to get one click for every 3000 ads. So you run mm -hmm. 3000 ads, you get one click and they were making pennies per, per, per thousand ads as a result. We were able to hundred X that literally mm -hmm. 100 times more efficient and effective. And so instead of getting one click for every 3000 ads, we were getting 30 clicks for every ad. Like we cr crush it because mm -hmm. we had, we had built good tools that targeted the right ads, to the right people at the right time for things that they wanted. So 
you go to booking.com and you're looking for a hotel in Sao Paulo. And we were like, hey, here's a hotel in Sao Paulo. Here's the price. Here's the dates you're looking for. And people clicked on those and they bought those. And so the ad prices that we were able to pay Facebook went up by a dramatic number. So now Facebook sees this and their ads start to take off. Their business starts to take off. And they're like, holy shit, this is how we do it. And so then there's this big meeting that happened between Cheryl and the ads team. I don't think Zuck was there, but there's a big group of them that get together and they're like, okay, do we stay open and let all these independent providers buy media for the advertisers or do we fuck all those guys, build mm -hmm. the tools ourselves and close and go direct so the advertisers have to buy from us directly? They chose to go direct and to become a closed ecosystem. So I have a scar across my belly from one side to the other from yeah. getting gutted by Facebook mm -hmm. as a result of that decision. Uh, and my business, I mean, we literally went from a million in revenue to 30 million in revenue in 12 months. And we had 300 million in revenue on the books. Like we were like, we would have blown it out if mm -hmm. they had stayed open, but they went the other direction. And they they killed us. How was that? And so the whole ecosystem yeah. has largely done that. So Google has mm -hmm. done that. Facebook has done that. Amazon has done that. They've all kind of become very closed. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question for you. Still living in San Francisco? I am currently still in San Francisco. No, um, Miami plans on the books. Oh, no. No, Miami's never <laughs> been my jam. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm... I'm deeply, deeply, deeply frustrated with this city. I'm deeply mm -hmm. frustrated by the idiocy that they have driven this city into the ground. Um, it's choppy right now. There's, there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's hints of, of goodness again, and it's, they're cleaning up. They're doing a good job cleaning up parts of it. But like, I mean, they, they literally destroyed this city and it's going to take mm -hmm. years, years to grind our way through this. Um, the big, the big question for me is what happens in the next election? Mm -hmm. Like if the voters of San Francisco are like, Oh, we want more of this. I've become very depressed and dispirited. If the voters yeah. of San Francisco are like, okay, enough of this. Let's get rid of these idiots that like are just like, I mean, these, 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 there's ideologues run the city and they just do stupid things after stupid thing after stupid thing. And it's like the voters, if they, they put up with more of this and mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to be bad. Well, I'll be there in 10 days. Okay. So maybe you and I can oh, yeah. grab a coffee. Hang out. It'd be nice to see you in person. Come have, come have coffee in my, in my hood and we'll, I'll show you, uh, I'll show you around. That'd be great. Yeah. Zach, thanks so much for joining. Great to see oh, you. Oh, my pleasure. Great to see you too. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Nate Guatney, for handling the audio LinkedIn, for having me as part of your podcast network. And once again, to all of you, the listeners, if you've been listening for a while, want to give us a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, that would be awesome. If you're a new listener and want to hit subscribe, we do these flagship interviews every Wednesday, and then we break down the news on Friday. On Friday, Ron John, Ron, Ron John Roy is back with us. We're going to cover everything that's happened this week. You don't want to miss it. All right. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time on Big Technology Podcast.